So it's my pleasure uh, to be here. Welcome and see my colleagues from Japan. So it's nice that we have this conference and I hope that it will bridge Luxembourg to Japan and we'll see more often. I'm looking forward to see you uh, again and discuss with you. So but the title of the talk is, might be a bit mysterious. So the search of a universal estimator in statistics. So I will try to explain. I think because it's the last talk, we're all tired and I would want to go home. So I've decided not to go into mathematical details. I'll just try to share with you some thoughts I have. Information, but not much math. Um, before before I, I, I move to the topic of the talk, I would just to say a few words about uh, the Sandal project who is supporting the conference. So um, the Sandal project is in fact a grant that is received by the university in order to develop data science at this university. So this is what I'm doing and this is what also my dear colleagues are doing with me. So Christoph Lai, Mark Poldowski, I also have the help of Giovanni Piketty and Ivo Pida. And, and with this grant, what we want to do is support international conferences at the university and the broad world data science. We also organize winter schools. And, and uh, last but not least, also launch um, a master of data science. And students are there. It's very special. Okay, so this is what I'm doing, and then I'm um, also also this this grant gave the, the opportunity to to recruit some some people. So I have uh, two PhD, Jun Chen, Alexandre Le Cestre, and one postdoc, which is Guillaume Maillard, and we are all working in a certain area of mathematical statistics. And I'm going to give you an account of what we're trying to do in the team. Okay, so my next slide is actually very much on the line which is what Christoph Light said yesterday. So uh, what, I'm going, what we want to do is we imagine that we observe some phenomenon okay, and we want to understand a little better what this phenomenon is about. So we want to have information about it in order to, do, in order to draw conclusions or to take actions. And, and these actions and conclusions should be drawn on the basis of, of data, okay? So we observe the feminine, we collect this data and have those conclusions and to take actions. And there is actually no way to do so unless we have what we call a statistical model. So that's what a lot of you are, are, are doing. So when you have this data, you have to imagine that the distribution of this data is not something which is completely arbitrary, but that the distribution belongs to some class of possible distributions, and that's what we call the statistical model. And once you have designed your statistical model, you just pretend that the true distribution of your data belongs to the statistical model in order to do some inference. Okay, so of course we go to all these troubles to make those decisions and conclusion if the conclusion is not clear just by looking at the data. Okay, otherwise we won't go into those troubles. I mean, if I want to, to decide if a drug is safe or not, okay, and I carry out an experiment, and I see that all the rats are dead, then definitely you will not try on humans. Okay, you will not go into this kind of, of, of problems, you wouldn't try to go into a statistical model, because whatever the, step, the conclusion is, I will not try the drug. Okay, so, so um, I'm going to be a little, more, a little bit more specific about that. So I would like to introduce another example, uh, which is inspired by Dalina and Kazai. <laughs> so, just uh, imagine that you receive some signal from space. Okay, that's the the data we call it, and and. Well, I'm going to try to model this, this data. I'm going to take a very, very simple statistical model because I don't want to bother with difficult statistical model. So I'll just take a very simple one. I just imagine that my signal is constant over time. 
so my signal is constant, but I observe it with the noise. And I model the distribution of the noise, not with the Gaussian. I just want to change a little bit. I just model it with a uniform distribution. I've also taken this example because 20 years ago, uh, an astronomer came to my office and asked me if there were some statistical procedure to detect some signal. And he said, well, my signal I want to detect has a very, very small amplitude. And I would like to know if there is a signal or not. And I realized that what this astronomer was trying to do is, in fact, detecting gravitational waves. And it was, it was in the project Virgo, you might know, which was the European project for detecting gravitational waves. And, and actually, there was a Nobel Prize about it. He didn't get it because there was a, a competitor to the um, uh, Virgo, which was LIGO, detected the gravity. But I realized at that, at that time that there was, using very, very uh, accurate statistical models in order to detect those, those signals with very small amplitude. And, and, and these were necessary because they wanted to have a curiosity. So I'm imagining, of course, I'm oversimplifying this model here. Assume the signal is constant. And we... But uh, it remains that I want to estimate the signal or this constant as accurate as I can do, as, as can be. I want to be very accurate at the estimation of this constant theta star. OK, so with my statistical model, with the statistical model I have, this is what the data should look like. They are uniformly distributed in an interval of length one, which is centered at some theta star. And I want to estimate the center. So the point is, how do I estimate theta star? So, so this is the audience particip participation part. You can say how you would like to estimate the theta star. So, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, Mary Carolina, who's from the master data center, what, what would you do? <laughs> you can say whatever you want, it's not really important. Good. Okay, so we can try, well, we can do, of course, the average of the day. The average of the data is, is, is what you would end up if you use least squares. Least squares, least squares estimated in this situation is just an empirical mean. You could go for the, the, the empirical median, which is slightly more involved. This would be the minimizer of the sum of absolute values. So very traditional, very common and classical statistical methods. Um, if most of the statistician would probably take this one, yeah, that's the one that Marx uh, suggested, because it corresponds to maximum likelihood. That's the maximum likelihood. It takes the maximum of the data and the minimum of the data and take the, the average of those two. And maybe some of you are Bayesian statisticians, so they would go for prior and they will calculate the posterior distribution and then this very situation if the posterior if the prior is not then you will end up with a posterior that concentrates around an interval of of length which is approximately one over n okay so we have all those methods and since i said i want to have accuracy then i have to analyze this method and say what is the accuracy i will get on my theta star knowing that i have n observations that's what we do Okay, so it's not very difficult to see that x n bar, because of the central limit theorem, will give you an accuracy of 1 over square root of n. So if I have 100 data, you would get an accuracy of 1 over 10. You could also go for empirical median, and it's not difficult. Empirical median would also give you an accuracy of order 1 over square root of n. Of course, I'm passing constants. Okay, you can do very specific calculation on the stuff and calculate everything, but the order of magnitude. 
respect to the number of observations. If you do maximum likelihood, you would go for, you would get something which is of order one over n, which is much better. So you get an accuracy of one over 100 if you have 100. And if you do Bayes statistics, that's what you would. OK, so the conclusion of that, if probably most of statisticians would, would go for maximum likelihood or statistics, because that's what provides the best accuracy. But in real life, um, my data are not usually exactly drawn according to my model. When you use a model in statistics, it's usually an approximation of the truth. Maybe all, not all my data are exactly distributed this way. And just imagine that I'm, I'm, not in, it, it, I'm, I'm in a good situation. Maybe I have 1,000 data that are exactly drawn according to this model. So my model is perfectly correct, except for one. One data. So imagine that you are in this situation here. I just add one point, which is not drawn according to the model. So no matter if I have 1,000 data that are perfectly correct, if I add this extra point, that will deteriorate most of the estimators that I've written on, on, this, on this slide. Of course, if you're doing the average of the data, if you have one data which is really far away, then will get a very poor estimation of theta star. Um, for the empirical median, the situation is different because the empirical median is taking the point which is at the middle of the sample. So you move from one point in the middle to another point which is in the middle, that will not change anything, or not much. So this estimation, or this estimator, will remain quite stable. Of course, if I use maximum likelihood, that will be terrible because I'm taking the maximum of the data. So it's going to be terrible. So a good estimation of the star. And in, in the case of the Bayesian posterior, the, the posterior will not exist. It's just likelihood is just zero. So. so the conclusion of that is if I'm really, really sure that my model is correct and, and perfectly describes the data, I would go for Bayesian or maximum likelihood estimator. But what if my model is just an approximation of the truth? If you're, if you're not really sure that your model is correct for all the data you have, then maybe you would go to an empirical median. But then you lose accuracy. So the question is, how can I design a strategy that could do both, that could give me the best possible accuracy, the model is correct or correct, and that would be robust or stable. The fact that we are just modeling a phenomenon and the model we're using is probably an approximation of the That's the problem I would like to solve. And um, I don't want to solve it in this particular sense. Uh, the point is, how can we just solve this problem in all possible statistical models? All possible statistical models. Can we design a universal procedure that could be applied in any statistical model for which you try to estimate the distribution of data in order that two conditions are achieved, First condition, I want that if my model is correct, the estimator I built with this universal procedure will only, always end up with an estimator which is optimal, which will always give me the best possible accuracy in my model. So I would like to get something in this example of order 1 over n. And the second condition is that the estimator is stable if my model is just an approximation of the truth. So I would like to have some kind of universal approach to solve this problem. And what we see is that the maximum likelihood is in general, not always, but in general good for solving problems when the, estimate, when the model is absolutely correct and exact. 
but it can behave very poorly if it's just approximation of the So we have this kind of picture. This is the one mind that when we collect data, we try to model this data so that we have on the left part the statistical model we imagine to be the truth for the distribution of our data, but we have to keep in mind that probably reality is on the right side here. So maybe my data are just independent. Maybe they are not IID or exactly IID. And maybe if my model is not too stupid, if my model is approximately correct, it means that probably my model is giving me uh, an approximation or a good approximation of most of the marginal distribution of my data. But maybe not all. Maybe there are some points which are far away from the model, which corresponds to outliers, something which are undesirable. Some might be in the model, but very far away from one point of the model, far away from the other marginals. Okay, so there could be this kind of situation. And I want to find a way of solving this kind of situation, providing an estimator that will be close to the p-bar on the, on the right side, which means that would provide an estimation of most of the marginals of, of the model. Okay, so this is an old, actually some kind of old problem. I think the first one who tried to solve, the, to solve it was Lucien Lecam, who was not a fan of the MLE, of the maximum likelihood estimator. There were really some really funny papers about Lecam on maximum likelihood estimator. And they wanted to find a surrogate because they wanted to find a surrogate to the maximum likelihood. Find something which is better that could be used for estimation. And um, actually, he didn't, he didn't find a, so, a reasonable solution to that problem. But he discussed with Lucien Birger, that was in the 70s. And uh, Lucien Birger uh, was the first we've been able to, to find some very general solution to this problem, how to design an estimator that would be optimal and with some kind of robustness with respect to model misspecification. There were some conditions on this approach. Um, yeah, it was, it was not um, universe, completely universal. For example, the model had to be totally bounded, um, there were some condition of metric dimension, but it was really a first step saying that maybe there could be a solution to the problem. And I did, so I think the paper appeared in the 80s. I don't know about it. And, and he made a, a, another version of this paper much after the, I think it was 2010 or something. 2006, actually, 2006. And, and I read this paper, and, and I was amazed. This paper, because I, I never thought that there could be a solution to this problem, actually. And I didn't know there was something which was very, very convincing that could really solve this kind of problem. And, and the math behind those, the results were really nice. So I decided that I, w I wanted to learn more. And, and, and so I've worked on this problem for many years to see how we, can, we could solve it. So we discussed with Lucien Birger, and we found um, some solution of this problem, which is called row estimation. So what I'm going to do now is not to give you all the mathematical details about row estimation. Um, what I'm going to do is just twofold. First, tell you what is a row estimator. Estimator, so the definition of row estimator. And the other thing I would like to give you is an illustration of the mathematical properties of this estimator. And to give you an illustration of these mathematical properties, I will just take a simulation, simulation that I will discuss with you and tell you why it illustrates the properties of row estimators. Okay, that's what I'm going to do, so that I'm going to avoid to do mathematical state. Let's go for row estimators. So, as I said, um, in fact, 
it turns out that those estimators are really surrogates or substitute to the maximum likelihood, and I will see when I will give you the definition that they are actually quite close. When, when we found the result, actually, we had no idea we will end up with this. Okay, so now I'm going to present you, we may say, well, it's quite obvious, but when we started it, it was not obvious at all that would we'll give something which is just a modification of the ML. So what we do is, of course, you, you have your favorite statistical model, which I call uh, capital M. So you have densities with respect to a reference measure that we would do if you were trying to do maximum likelihood estimation. And what you do is, for a given density P, this model, you compare the density P with another density in the model that I will call Q. And in order to compare two densities, you just do a test. And you could do a likelihood ratio test. So the likelihood ratio test would just be to take the ratio, of course, of these two densities, and you, do, you take the supremum over all possible Q in your model. So you will end up to this kind of formulation here, so the supremum over all densities in your model of the sum of a function psi. So if you're doing maximum likelihood, the function psi would just be the log. Maximizing the likelihood is just minimizes the supremum, okay? Uh, with psi being the log function, that's what is maximum likelihood. And it turns out that if you replace the logarithm, the expression of maximum likelihood, but this function psi here, which has the advantage of being bounded, it's bounded by minus one, then um, get the property. And this function psi actually is, as you see in this picture, very close to the... And that the point one, the, the, they have two derivatives, which are exactly the same. But this is something we, we found out afterward. So, okay, so this is the definition of our estimators. You just minimize the supremum of this functional, okay, and you end up with an estimator. So, okay, so let's see what our estimation is doing. So let's come back, for example, to this problem here. Try to estimate. Uh, the theta star in this uniform model, so the very simple example I gave you at the beginning. So what would be an estimator that is both robust, which is robust and optimal in this case? It's very simple. You just slide an interval of length one, okay? And when this interval contains most of the data, you stop. And you take the center of this interval. So it's clear that if there are no red points, you will end up with taking more or less the maximum of the data and the minimum of the data and taking the middle. That would be maximum likelihood. But if with those red points, you don't really actually care, you just take the interval that contains most of the data. You will end up with this robust estimator. Okay, so the title of the conference is complex data. So this is not complex data, so maybe I could... <laughs> move on to another statistical model, which is... So, um, this is some simulation that have been done by, by my PhD student, Jun Tong Chen. So, I'm going to take another example, another statistical model, and see what's happening with row estimation. So, imagine that um, you, have a date, we have, you have data which corresponds to the study of some disease. So you have patients, and you collect from those patients uh, and the, the clinical characteristic that will be my covariate WI. So you, you measure blood pressure, insulin rate, or whatever. So you have those clinical characteristics of patients. And you associate to the patient YI, which is a response to those covariates, which is 0 or 1, depending whether or not the patient is, has the disease or is healthy. That's what so you collect this data, and a, a, a statistical model for that is to go for logistic regression. But what? So you assume the data are just IID, and you assume that the probability of having the disease, um, knowing the covariate of the patient, is some 
parameter, which is, for example, given by this formula. Of course, you could choose whatever, another formula, but I just take this one, which is usually statistics. Okay, so this is my statistical model, but we have to keep in mind that it's just approximation of the truth. If you think of a database in, in, in a hospital, it is quite unlikely that the database contains people that have been taken at random among the population. It's not what happens. If those people are on the database, it's because they've been to the hospital. If they have been in the hospital, it's probably because they're not so healthy. Okay? So the fact that it's IID and represents the population is debatable. Uh, you may also think that maybe there is a difference between, even if two persons has the same clinical characteristic, but maybe being a male or a female is an influence of the probability that having the disease. So, as you see, maybe my data is not so IID and there is some kind of discrepancy. I'm not even talking about the fact that in a database there might be, there might be some mistake in the recording of the data. This is something that could happen. Okay, so um, let's go to see what happens. So, we, we, in the simulation I'm going to present, we compare row estimator to maximum likelihood estimator. So I first start with the situation where the model is exact. Okay, there is no problem. This describes perfectly the data and see what happens. So what happens is, so what are those numbers? Those numbers are, we look at the distance the squared halogen distance. If you don't know what is halogen distance, you can think just as a distance between two probabilities. So the probabilities we're considering is just the true distribution of data and the estimator. So this is, in average, the square, some kind of square distance between true distribution of the data and the estimated one. And this is what we get. And we do it for maximum likelihood estimator and row estimator. And what you see is that you get exactly the same. We get exactly the same because you can prove that under very some kind of strong assumptions that if the model is exact, pro estimator will recover the MLE. So if you're a big fan of the MLE, you don't really have to choose between maximum likelihood estimator and row estimator. If the model satisfies some good condition, you will recover maximum likelihood estimator, so it's something you can prove. Um, the other thing is this number you find, so 0.0013, where does it come from? Does it come from the simulation study? Actually, not really. Give a full explanation about this number. Um, it does not depend on the regression function, on the function theta we've chosen. We could have chosen another function of, of, of the covariates that depends on six parameters in this case, and we would have obtained exactly the same result. We could have changed the Bernoulli distribution with another distribution, for example, if I don't to do Poisson regression or anything that belongs to an exponential family, we would exactly have found the same, because this number only depends on the number of data and how many parameters are in my statistical model? The formula is just number of parameters, six, divided by eight times the number of observations. So you can prove mathematically that this is what we would get. And that this is what we found in the simulation, so it's completely uh, consistent with the theory. But this is just some mathematical explanation, so I would like to give you another explanation for this number, which is be more equal. So, um, the explanation is the following. So imagine, okay, I give Giovanni, I said to Giovanni, uh, well, I, well, I'm not saying it. Somebody says to Giovanni, what is P star? Okay, what is the true distribution of the data? And of course, Giovanni draws P hat. And what I do with my p hat, with my estimator, I just, I just um, simulate fake data. Yeah, just more data, just fake, because I'm simulating them with p hat. And I said to Giovanni, are these data fake or not? And actually, Giovanni will not be able to say, 
unless the number of fake data are larger than 340. So if I, if I have less than 340 data, I'm sure that Giovanni will not be able to find out if these data are fake or not, because there, will be, there exists no statistical test that will be able to decide this. So this is how you can see that those two distributions are very close. I started with 500, and at the end, you need more than 340 to decide if those data are fake. Okay, so if the, uh, just, sorry, I'm just finishing. So if, if I add just one outlier among the sample, if there is one error in the reporting of data, let's say, among 500, this is what we get. So the rose stimulator is, is, is stable. Stable, but the maximum likelihood is just being just poor and useless. I would need 10 data to find out that fake data. I would need 10 fake data to see that maximum likelihood is not the truth. Okay, sorry, I'm, I've been a bit long, so this is some kind of references and...